Okay, today I have the great opportunity to talk to somebody who uh, I've never met before, but whose work I'm kind of familiar with. His name is Bruce Dawson, and he works for Output, but he also is quite an accomplished uh, musician. He's uh, got a lot of cool stuff out there. So I'm really anxious to kind of dive into this whole coder slash musician thing that you all know I love. Uh, so with that, let's say hello to Bruce. Hey, Bruce, how's it going? Hey, going good, Darwin. How are you? I'm fantastic. Uh, thanks so much for taking time out of what me, must be a super busy schedule. Um, why don't we start off by uh, having you describe a little bit about what your work is? Like you mentioned, I work over at Output. I'm a software developer there. I joined Output about four years ago, and uh, we were a company of about 12 people then, and today we're at about 40 employees. And back then we had a uh, office in Hollywood, and now we are located in downtown Los Angeles. And uh, back when we were in Hollywood, you know, things were just getting started and Output produced mainly contact instruments. Uh, contact, if you're not familiar with it, is a uh, synthesizer platform produced by Native Instruments. Uh, so Output would primarily make, you know, our instruments for the contact platform. And when I was hired on, I was hired as Output's very first in-house C++ developer. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, and so that's when we, that was uh, 2015 and... I had completed uh, graduate school that year. I'd gotten my uh, uh, MFA in music technology from California Institute of the Arts here in Valencia, California. I uh, got hired over at Output, and you know they were a fresh company, and and I was fresh out of uh, graduate school, and um, it was this kind of crazy, like, hey, we're up and coming, and you're up and coming, so let's see, you know, what we can do. So that was four years ago, and today we have a full-on development team, and I'm really grateful to just be part of the company and be where we are today and have, have watched it grow. And, and yeah, we'll get into all those details sure. soon. It's interesting to hear uh, that you started with them kind of early. But I mean, I remember some of those, uh, some of those contact instruments and they were really, they were really stunning, but it was when you guys really moved into the, you know, the straight plug-in development that I think that you really uh, really took on some uh, some pretty powerful stuff. Now, one of the interesting things is, and how I first actually decided I needed to reach out to you, is because uh, I recently took a little vacation, and as I do on vacation, I always take on a crazy new project. And uh, one of the projects I took on was taking a cadenza course, and it turns out that uh, a couple of developers from Output are uh, involved in creating some cadenza courses, of which you're you are one of those people. Tell me yeah. a little bit about the creation of a C plus plus programming course, and especially one focused on uh, working for on on being for musicians. Sure, as we know, C plus plus is a pretty deep topic. It's tough to teach more than one topic and. A course, you know, and the, and the topic of the Cadenza course is, you know, audio plugin development with C++. Go check that out if you haven't checked that out. That's on cadenza.com. When we started that, you know, we had to kind of draw a line of like how much C++ are we going to teach and how much audio development are we going to teach and how much DSP theory are we going to teach. Sure. It's, it was kind of a tough balance to get that right. Uh, and our first course is taught by uh, my good friend and coworker Jacob Penn. And... Uh, he was actually our, one of our like second or third employees right after me. And he teaches the first part, which is free to sign up and get started with. And that's just the, like the, the introduction to audio plugin development and, and just getting up and running with Juice. And when you take on a new framework like Juice, it is uh, not only almost a whole other ecosystem outside of C++ itself, but you know it's, all, it's a lot to digest. So it's nice to have some sort of structured guidance moving through that. So in the first course, J Jacob takes the time and teaches you how to start a new juice project, teaches you fundamental DSP theories. So that way you can get up and running and understand, you know, how a sine wave is broken down into discrete time and all that. And then the second course, which is taught by me, is the the advanced uh, audio plugin development course where we take all the fundamental concepts that uh, you're taught in the first half and we and we build out, you know, a proper UI and we build out our DSP in a modular fashion, you know, rather than being all in line and in your process block there, you know, we, we teach you how to break it into a more modular approach so you can just connect things up in a more easy way and things are more portable, uh, which 
which is really you know one of the big benefits of C++ is, is that you can build you know, management systems and DSP objects and GUI elements that are portable and you can move them between projects as long as you know how to build them in a way that allows you to do so. Right on, yeah. Well, one of the things that I certainly liked about the course, as far as I've gotten, um, is that it it does something that's really key. The Juice library, like any development library, is massive, and it at first seems completely opaque. And what I feel like you and Jacob have done is actually developed a map so, I mean, it just, it just, you know, it's like if I'm driving across Nebraska without a map, I'm going to have trouble, right? right? <laughs> yeah. Because Nebraska is a big place and I need a little help of knowing where to go. And um, that's what I feel like that you did with that course is, is you broke things down and, and provided a map. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I, you know, one of, when Jacob and I first sat down to brainstorm this, uh, it, it wasn't our idea, it was Output's idea, it was our CEO, Greg Lerman's idea, but. And Jacob and I took on the task. And when we sat down to, you know, plan things out together, we kind of really started with asking ourselves all the things that took us time to learn and things that I had to bang my head against the wall to, to figure out. Like, let's teach people that. Like, let's help, let's help them save time. Like, why spend an eight-hour day, like, learning something the hard way when we can lay it out for you? And there's something to be said about learning from other people's mistakes. And, and right I think on. that's even at a more meta level other than coding. But you know, when we can help people through the things that we had difficulty with, I think that kind of just sets people up for success. And, and that was really the most important goal for me is to be able to do this is the ability and the opportunity to set people up for success. So that way they can do this, you know, even if they're just starting out and they're not even certain and they don't even know what juice is or anything, you know, it's, you can get started. Yeah, well, it's uh, you did a you did a fantastic job. I really do appreciate that. Now, Thank one you. of the things that I actually really love about talking to people that do uh, music software development, yeah, is that inevitably they've got a background being like obsessive compulsive about music. And <laughs> um, right. I, when I did a little digging on you, I noticed what l looked suspiciously like an obsession with making music. Tell me a little bit about the music that you do. And um, how you how you tie that in with uh, the coding work? Absolutely. Um, I, I've played music for about almost the past decade here in Southern California under the name Synchronometry, uh, and it is a uh, DJing slash uh, music production project and even music technology project where I've initially started with DJing. You know, that was something that was uh, very inspirational to me growing up. It was, you know, the electronic music culture of the 90s and early 2000s was something that really caught my eye as a kid. And, you know, that led me towards the electronic music culture, which led me towards DJing, which led me towards, you know, even uh, a couple years back, organizing my own events under the synchronometry name here in Los Angeles, and uh, which then eventually led me to uh, pursuing a degree for music technology, which led me to output and that obsessive uh, mentality about music, uh, I can I can definitely relate to. You know, uh, for for me, ever since discovering electronic music, I wanted to know what what is going on in there. You know, how are these sounds that I've never heard before? How are these happening? Sure. You know, and kind of wanted to peek behind the curtain. And of course, you know, when you peek behind the curtain, everything kind of loses its mysticism. <laughs> but 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 I'm okay with that. You know, I I, I want to know how things work. You know. You know, and that that curiosity has really been a driving factor in my life. It started as a DJing project and then moved into uh, audio development as well as DJing. You know, I've been doing both simultaneously for years, you know, and it's really fulfilling to me. And you know, I consider music and the synchronometry project to be my passion project. And it's nice to be able to make audio uh, software. That is also my passion and I'm grateful to be paid for it right, and right. grateful to be able to do my music thing. And, uh, I've spent years trying to make it as a full-time musician and it's rough, you know, it's really rough. I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to be able to treat it as a passion project and it, and it really keeps it fun for me. Now, one of the things that is, uh, a really important component of this podcast is talking to people about their background. And, and this is really interesting to hear that, that you really came, 
Uh, you came to electronic music really from a DJing background and, and kind of from that fertile ground of the 90s and early 2000s, which I think yeah. anybody who kind of grew up in that time period or grew up musically during that time period right. will, will just remember it with fondness because if nothing else, it seemed like stuff was was constantly changing and constantly the envelopes were constantly being pushed, right? Absolutely, 100%. It was it was exciting. You yeah, know? it was really exciting. So in the podcast, I like talking to people about their background. Where were you, where were you coming from? Were you were you like living in Southern California and sort of like sucking it in from from that environment? Um, was it more of a listening thing? And and how did you tie in music making? Were you a band kid in high school or not? You know, right. how would it, how does music and the technology stuff, because I'll tell you, I, I've had a lot of people that have gone to Cal arts beyond this podcast. Nice. And one of the things I know is you don't walk into ta- Cal arts with a blank resume and they say, yeah, come on in. We'll take you on. You have to have a lot of skills kind of in your pocket by the time you get there. And I'm curious about where all those things developed. Right. Absolutely. It's a great question. And uh, for me, it really started, you know, I, I went to Cal Arts for a uh, music technology degree, and it really started with the technology first and grew into the music. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I don't really come from a musical family. My, my parents didn't play instruments. Uh, nobody around me really did, but it was still something I was interested in. And as a young teenager, I learned to play guitar and, you know, in grade school was in the, in the school band, um, not like the marching band, but like, you know, like sixth grade, like playing a little recorder and stuff like that. Right, right. And for me, the interest in technology really came first. And part of growing up in the, in the 90s, just as exciting as the electronic music was, the internet was very exciting then. And growing up in that time when the internet and AOL and Dancing Baby and all this silly stuff from them, <laughs> right? And all this I, stuff. I, I I haven't thought about Dancing Baby it's, for a decade. Exactly. <laughs> go go look yeah, exactly. Go look it up after this and enjoy. <laughs> yeah. You know, and all that was really exciting. And as a as a kid, I, I was um I'm thirty one, I was born in eighty eight, so I was just turning ten, eleven, twelve when, you know, Y two K was happening and I was growing up with the internet. You know, and I found the technology really interesting. And you know, I used to have a, a old gateway computer that we didn't have internet on, but I would like sign up for free internet services and get us on the internet. And you know, as a ten-year-old or whatever, technology really came first at that point. And after discovering the internet and all that, I discovered this language called QBasic. Mm. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's a an old programming language and it was on windows and it had this ugly blue screen with the white right. text. And I learned how to make little programs and I, w- I would try to replicate like video games and stuff and nothing. I would never make anything serious cause I didn't have the proper resources to learn it other than just trial and error. So I was making little like pixel characters and stuff and being able to move them around with your, the WASD keys and all that on your computer. And, and so the technology came first and I ended up, I went to undergraduate school at a school called uh, DeVry University out here. And it's like a technical trade school sure, or technical right. college. Yeah. And I got my um, my bachelor's in computer science there and, you know, started to learn all that. And then as I was graduating undergraduate, that's when I was really gaining an interest in DJing and uh, really just started to just obsessively learn how to do that because, uh, I had the the means to be able to do it. I, I was gifted a uh, like an old turntable setup. Well, it was new at the time. Now it's old. <laughs> and uh, and uh, yeah, I just obsessively played it. And I would have friends over, and I would mix all this music that didn't mix together, and have a small library and play the same stuff over and over. And they hated it, but they loved me, so it was fine, you know. And then eventually, from that, through some friends, they were like, "Hey, we're gonna we're going to book you for a party, and you should come DJ." And I played in this little back room at this venue in Culver City. And I played in the like outdoor back area and some tiny little speakers and that same DJ setup because I, I brought it with me and set it all up. And, and that was the start of it. And it just kept being obsessively passionate about playing music. And, and I graduated undergraduate and I actually just kept doing the music thing. I didn't even pursue any kind of like coding jobs or anything. I was just so obsessed about the music and, and was able to pursue that. So I did and hosted events over the years here in Los Angeles, DJed 
you know, hundreds of parties out here. And, and then that eventually led me to looking into CalArts. And, and I was so into the, to the DJing thing that I realized, like, if I'm going to keep doing this, and I didn't know music theory or anything at that point. Mm-hmm. And I realized, like, if I'm ever going to be anything more than a guy just mixing two tracks, I need to learn. So I applied to CalArts and went through their application process, which was, if I remember correctly, it was to um, make for the music technology program. I don't remember the full process, but one part of it was to mock up like a MIDI controller or something like that. Like if you were to make some sort of musical device or instrument or something, how would you make it? And I didn't have any like AutoCAD skills or anything like that. So I just like hand drew it. Basically. <laughs> I really did. And, uh, nice. you know, sent in my application and kind of crossed my fingers, just, you know, just did my best and sent it in and was like, I hope something cool happens. And I got a letter in the mail back and I really didn't even know what to expect. And I opened it up and it was like, you're accepted to the, to the music technology program. And I was just so blown away. I have like a thousand questions about this. Yeah. Cause first yep. of all, um, this idea of like going from, uh, a DJ guy where everyone, they love you, but they kind of hate your, <laughs> your DJing to all of a sudden doing hundreds of shows. There seems like, it seems like there's a great big missing piece there somewhere, but also I am wondering, <laughs> yeah. given my, my background with my family was one where they didn't really understand anything that I was getting involved in with music. Right. right. I'm wondering like how your parents, they see you go and, and go to DeVry and work on computer right. science and all this stuff. And then you're right. a DJ. I mean, were they right. freaking out or did they, were they like, you go, man, how, how supportive were they in that process? You know, they were, uh, they were definitely supportive, but at the same time, I could definitely feel like, what is this path that you're taking? You got to pick something, <laughs> you know, you can't, when are you going to grow just, up? Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, and it, you know, what are you doing? And, and then I got accepted to this program and it was kind of like, do this and you better, you better do something after this and didn't want to get stuck in the, in the academia world and just keep going to school and being a professional student to get out there and and do something. And I went to output and I ended up, you know, getting connected to output through my mentor over at CalArts, Jordan Hokenbaum. Hey Jordan. Okay. He connected me with my good friend and coworker, Jay Castone over at output. And yeah, they connected me with CEO and, you know, we got in there and did all that. So you went right from CalArts right into output? I did, you know, and I was working on, you know, at CalArts as part of the master's program, you have to do a thesis and Uh, Mine was on uh, approaches to computer-aided algorithmic composition, which is a a field where we write, you know, algorithmic code that helps make music or generates music based on some sort of data that you provided it. So I was working, you know, I was working really hard and had the the music background. And I think what really got output, because, you know, they're like, why why would they hire you? (laughs) You know, it's like you're fresh out of college, you probably want somebody else, you know, but they definitely looked at my background and passion for music. And I feel like, you know, they knew that they had some somebody special and willing to commit and, you know, make it happen. I just went in there is I let them know, like, I'm so serious about like doing audio development. Like this is literally my dream job. Yeah. This is literally what I want to do. If I get a no here today that, you know, I'm not stopping, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> so like, let's make something happen because somebody's going to hire me. You right, know what I mean? Right. And, sure. Uh, when Apple hired me, I had uh, an offer from another company, not an audio company, but it was making a, a software company, making point of sales software. If you think about like the registers at Target or something, yeah, uh, yeah. that kind of software. And that's cool. There's a need for it, but that does not excite me. <laughs> you know, that is not what I went to school for. Right. So I was grateful to get the job at Output while this other company was looking into me and it, and it really it like kind of came down to the wire because it was like they both needed an answer and an output was like yeah so we we want this guy we're not going to let him go do this other stuff yeah just so grateful for output and so i started there and we started development on movement almost right away okay yeah. i was i was going to ask what was the what was the first product that you had worked on it was movement huh that yeah, was movement yeah and that was Essentially, about 90% of the application was me. And over about six, seven months, uh, I worked day in, day out, nights, weekends. It didn't matter because I wanted 
to not only like do the thing and, and get this launched, but to really like prove to output that you guys made the right choice. Right. I worked just so, so hard. Like it put writing a master's thesis to shame, like how hard <laughs> that works. It really did. Like I thought, I thought graduating of my MFA was tough. Like I did this and it was, it was unreal. And that's not uh, output work culture today. Output work, work culture is very balanced. We're all about that work life balance and, we respect our time off and we're structured and we, and we work smart so that way people do have their weekends off and stuff. But when you're a young company and you're a startup and you have 12 people and they're going out on a limb hiring you to build their first C++ app, for me it was a uh, failure is not an option kind of moment. Right. Yeah, well, I was going to say this had to be a real watershed moment for the company too because right. they were going from doing sound design to doing something very different, which is building and supporting the the – plug-in platform there's a lot of new ground that they had to they had to walk in order to get there absolutely absolutely and we, and we did have some help from um our outside sources our uh, friends over at a uh, future audio workshop they they helped us out initially in the beginning along with our buddy artemy pavlov over at sign vibes and these guys they helped us kind of build our like foundational architecture of, of movement so sure. like when i got hired on these guys were kind of already outsourced to kind of working on their respective parts of it. And uh, when I got in, I inherited this code and it was kind of half done. And, and I started piecing together test apps and stuff. From bring what it home. Had. Right. Yeah. yeah, I, had to, yeah I had to bring it home. Like here's, here's some parts. Here's what we do have, you know, make it work. Yeah. Now when in doing that, what was both for you personally and maybe for the company, what were mm -hmm. the hardest early lessons that you had to do? Because coming, I mean, frankly, as and and CalArts is just notorious for being uh, for pushing people to the edge and and making them work really hard and making them you know pushing them to be creative, right? But um, as you said, this is sort of like you know next level when you when you're doing this stuff. And I'm curious, what are the things that were the like real learning points or the real surprises that you ran into? Uh, when you started working a commercial plugin development, so going to school at CalArts, you know they're definitely rigorous with their their program, and you know they teach you audio development there. But the scope of work between a college level homework assignment for audio development and a full scale professional secure app is just no comparison, really. All the all the things that kind of go into building something like Movement you know, or arcade even, you know, these, these have just capabilities beyond, you know, what is taught in, at the coll collegiate level. In, at CalArts, you know, they taught us, you know, fundamental DSP and polymorphism, C++ concepts and stuff. And this is stuff I was already familiar with through um, undergraduate, but I was reapplying the audio side of it to the foundational C++ skills I had, I had learned already. But once you go into building something that's commercial level, like, Think about, uh, you know, a serial key system, you know, think about folder management, you know, and writing files and reading files. Think about reading presets and writing to presets, you know, think about learning asynchronous messaging and synchronous messaging between different parts of the application. Think about things leaking in pointer usage. There's no, you can't make a good app with it leaking and doing all this <laughs> funny stuff and crashing, you know, so there was... <laughs> There was so much trial and error while building movement specifically. And a lot of that, it, it was the first, you know, everybody's first time, you know, like building this, you know, serial key system or something like that. Right. And we had some assistance from our friends on the outside, which was super helpful. But really, it's like there's writing, <laughs> there's writing C++ and then there's writing good C++. And you can write one thing a million different ways. It's all about using your experience to know how to build something in the most efficient way possible. Right. Absolutely. Now, all of this stuff is based off of the Juice Audio Framework, which yep. is uh, sort of also the core of what you're teaching in this Cadenza course. Yeah. How do you like working with Juice, and how has that like cracked open the door for uh, getting some of the stuff done that you need to do? Yeah. I mean, I love it. it it's a great platform. Um, it's not perfect, obviously, but it is very good at a lot of different things. The Juice community is very responsive, and the 
uh, developers over at Roly and the Juice team, they're, they're very good at getting back to people when they have feature requests or pull requests for the framework. And it's a very community-driven framework that does a lot of things for a lot of people. And that's a really hard thing to do. You can't make everybody happy, you know, but you can make a lot of people happy. So I've found Juice to be uh, really beneficial. And there's, there's a graph somewhere on the internet that I've seen, or it's like a, a chart, right? And it has all these nodes connected together. And there's like 50, 60 different nodes, and they're all connected together. And then there's this one node in the middle, and that's your plugin. And it's, and it's a graph of what Juice is doing. And it has all the under, underlying, you know, audio uh, processing, the MIDI processing, it, key detection. You know, it can do almost anything. And then there's your app sitting right in the middle. And, you, and it, what that really does, it frees up your time from all the, like, esoteric architectural stuff that you'd have to do with just straight, you know, from straight C++. Like, I don't see it, like, feasible or even, like, reasonable to, like, try to build an audio plugin without a framework. Right. You know, right. like how would you even do that? Like you'd have to just know so much about every single thing to even like process the MIDI that's coming in from the keyboard that you plugged in. Juice takes a lot of that kind of stuff and just simplifies it and abstracts it so you can you can just get right to work. And I find that really beneficial. Yeah, no kidding. Well, and you know, it's like <laughs> depending on how far back you want to go, I mean it's it's almost impossible now to imagine like having to have, you know, having to write the code that decodes what a, what's in a WAV file or what's in an AIFF file and then making a file handler that can handle both WAV and AIFF and, oh, my God, there's MP3. Pull your hair out, you know. So much of that stuff now is abstracted by something like Juice and that really eases the burden of this crap work so that you can kind of focus on the creative stuff. Yeah, absolutely. That's my favorite part about it and, you know, why I would... Like, think about how many hours it took the Juice team to, you know, be able to support right, to do it, all those. Yeah. yeah, you know, right. it's like you would never, you'd never get the job done. You just have all these tools that do all this stuff and be burnt out by the time it comes time to make your cool thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so, given that you're teaching Juice now, what, yeah, what did the process of developing? I mean. You know, I work at Cycling. We we sell a programming tool, but it's a different kind of thing than C++ programming. I'm mm -hmm. curious about the development of a course for C++ programming. And again, how you're able to uh, kind of break things down and and what level of detail you decide to, to dive into. Because there's an infinite number of things you can cover. So I'm curious, what, how did you make the decisions about what you were going to teach? Right. So getting the first and second course down together, me and Jacob decided, like I said, we, we want to figure out what are the things we had difficulty with and let's teach it out to people so that way they don't have to struggle like we did. And then after we decided that, we split, you know, the first and second course down the middle so we could figure out what's the, you know, fundamental knowledge people need to know and what is the, uh, you know, more advanced stuff that people should learn once they have the fundamentals down. Um, and then when it was time for the second course, what I did basically to get the course up and running is I just sat down and just made, you know, just made a plugin from scratch as simple as I could using the juice components without any of our custom output stuff, because, you know, we've built our own, uh, layer on top of juice, our sure. own framework uh, right. that handles, you know, more complex things like arcade. So I, I was like, let's build a simple plugin. Um, that's interesting and looks cool, uh, but it's just simple enough for people to get it together. So I built this uh, uh, delay chorus uh, little module, you know, just an audio effect, and it's either a delay or a chorus. And in that process, you know, it has a, a panel structure, and it has a little preset system, and it has input gains and output gains and view meters and stuff. And it has a cute little background and, and nice, you know, knobs. And, you know, it's just... It's just advanced enough for people to look at and say, how do I do that? And just simple enough to be able to teach people in eight sessions or whatever. Right. And uh, so it was kind of like a reverse engineer process of writing my own plugin. So I wrote, wrote a simple plugin and the reverse engineered and broke it down into all the information that I think, you know, would help people build that up. Yeah. One of the things that I know from my experience with the course is that, 
and it had to be a little bit difficult, was figuring out exactly how much C++ to talk about and how much juice and how much DSP programming to talk about. And you actually, you you um, sort of danced a fine line, but I thought in a pretty effective way in that uh, the C++ stuff that was discussed that mm-hmm. maybe would, uh, would be tough for someone who's not super versed in it. Um, mm-hmm. It was it was of a level that you could easily go to Stack Overflow or something and kind of get some answers about like what is it I just saw, <laughs> you know? right, right? And similarly with the juice stuff, you you were pretty explanatory about why you were choosing to use things, and I think that that when I talked before about there being a map, I think mm-hmm. that that's one of the keys with any programming system. Uh, that makes a mapping kind of thing important, which is it's not like, what can I do? I mean, you can get a list of the functions or get a list of the data structures and say, oh, look, here's all the shit I can do, right? Right. right. But um, it's like, why do I want to do these things? Or when do I choose one over the other? That is really kind of like some key fundamental information. It's something that you reveal in a in a kind of a subtle but pretty useful way i think i appreciate that i appreciate that and yeah i I just wanted to be able to dance that that line and show people you know just what's important for achieving the goal of making the plugin that we make at the end of the course and not make it oversaturated with just all this information like let's let's pick a few key things let's talk about them let's talk about the benefits and having reverse engineered the the plugin from the end and built the course from the end to the beginning, you know, it really helped kind of shape that path. That was uh, something I learned when I was younger is like, when there's a path that you want to walk, there's somewhere you want to be, like, look look at yourself at the end of that path and, and ask, how, how did I get here? Yeah, break it down from there, sure. Break it down, see yourself at the end and break it all the way down and how did I get there each way? So I really apply that concept to my coding style, even even music. When I make music, I'll uh, it's kind of like a subtractive process where I'll make all the sounds at once and then <laughs> subtract things away until you kind of chip away at the marble till you reveal the sculpture. You know. Right. Do you still make music fairly regularly? Oh yeah, yeah. I still work on it. You know, every week I'm 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 in my studio right now. I'm just putting up uh, some acoustic panels right now, and uh, I've got nice output platform desk in here and. You know, I make music a couple nights a week, and and it's fulfilling, you know. Sure. And, it, and it can be tough to have the energy to make music every night when I get home from output. You know, it was one of the things that when I started there, a lot of friends were like, "Oh man, be careful, you're gonna be tired. Like you gotta, <laughs> you gotta stay on it. You gotta keep keep working on your music." And I see that because you know I'm in front of a computer all day. I'm thinking all day. It's like solving puzzles all day, really. You know, and I get home and and I'm sometimes I'm just tired uh but you got to get in there you got to make music and or i got to make music because it feels good and i mean i have other hobbies also that help me get off the computer which is nice so for me it's all about like a life balance and doing things that that make me happy and music is one of those things sure when now when you make music do you use the computer and do you use a lot of the tools that you build or are you yeah. or or do you use music as like a way to escape all that stuff uh no I definitely I, I definitely use our stuff I um one I I have all the output stuff so it's nice to use <laughs> right yeah <laughs> you know, exactly so it's already in the pocket right exactly it's already in the pocket pull it out and it sounds great you know I'm not uh, the super obsessive type that needs to like sculpt every sound from a pure sine wave until it right. sounds perfect uh, music for me is a fun process and if something sounds good and it's in the right key put it in there hit record sure. You know? And uh, yeah, I use a lot of the output stuff. And, and one of my musical goals, which is like just my own personal goal, I guess I don't even think I've ever really mentioned this to anybody. So you're hearing it first. One of my goals is be able to make all my music eventually from things that I've coded, you know? So like every sound is not only all original, but like down to the bite level. Yeah, well, that's, that's one of the things I was going to ask because you yeah. are actually one of the people that would have the facility to make all the tools that you use. Right. But, um, and I was curious if that is, if that is alluring at all. It is. It's alluring a little, little bit. Like 
it's something I desire, but I find in the grand scheme of life, it's not important. Either. <laughs> <laughs> I think there's bigger, bigger problems out there. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's definitely a self-fulfilling thing. And, but at the end of the day, once I make a track completely from my own code and stuff, it's gonna be like, woohoo, sounds yeah. good. Right. right. <laughs> it's yeah. another track. You know? <laughs> well, yeah. I know, I noticed on your SoundCloud, uh, that you actually do, uh, that you've recorded and released uh, a lot of performance stuff. So you're also also yeah. out there doing performances as well. This is all yeah. DJ performances largely. Yeah, these these are largely these are all DJ performances That's at it. this point. Okay. Uh, do you, no, no do you insert your own music when you're doing DJing, or or do you kind of keep that as a separate thing? I do when it fits. Uh huh. Um, sometimes as a DJ, I play uh, styles of house, techno, and trance, and uh, Every gig that I get is a different time of day and has a different vibe. So if one of my tunes fits into the to the flow of the music, I'll definitely put it in there and people dance and it's fun and it's more or less, you know, fulfilling to me to hear my own tune. And sometimes I'll run out there and go hear what it sounds like in between the speakers <laughs> and then run back in, you know, when it fits. I don't try to shoehorn my own music into the flow of what I have going on because as a DJ, I do play other people's music as well. So a lot of those right. recordings are my favorite artists and, and, you know, things that I find that are interesting as I'm looking for music. So man, our time is already running out. Uh, oh, wow. Yeah, I know. Go All figure, right. right? Yeah. But, um, before we go, I am just curious about one thing. I mean, you are, you know, you, you've actually accomplished a lot of amazing things in the, in the time that you've been doing, you've been a coding God, right? But I am curious, what is out there that you still want to do? I mean, do you have any desire to get get into programming for hardware, or do you have any anything like that? What are what is there anything outside of plugin development that that you really have a desire to to try? You know, what's most appealing to me in in the realm of programming for what's next is just more of a thorough understanding of like really in-depth DSP. And I know that's really math heavy and there's a certain line that's kind of drawn between like DSP development and just like general plugin development. Right. And uh, I find myself really skilled at the architectural side of things, uh, but less skilled at the math side of like filter design or building an EQ, oh, sure. right. you know, and, and, and I can maintain and implement all that stuff and I can fix bugs in there, you know, but if you tell me to go and just like give me a blank space, slate and start making the filter coefficients like for like say an analog modeled filter not just a simple filter but like a really filtery kind of filter right <laughs> you know no, no. Uh, you know that that stuff's tough you know and that's its own expertise and that's the kind of that's like the the last curtain i want to peek behind for the audio development so that way i can really do the full 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 proper full stack thing you know because i you know done it all with the c plus plus from, you know, like network connectivity to encryption with serial key stuff to, you know, UI development to auto generation for building big, you know, big architectures and that the little the little sandbox of the DSP module, like getting really in depth, you know, that seems like a rabbit hole that can just keep going and going. <laughs> I think you're probably right. Right. Uh, in fact, everybody I know that gets into it, I don't I don't see them for years then. So. Oh no. Yeah. <laughs> it's one of those things I think. Yeah. Yeah. Well, man, I want to thank you so much for taking the time again out of your schedule. I, I appreciate you kind of shoehorning me in, but this was really a great talk. It was fascinating to kind of hear about your, your trails. I, I've got a ton of more stuff I wish we could talk about. We'll have to save it for yeah. next time. Yeah, there's a lot more to the story for sure, but oh, yeah, okay. next time we'll, let's do this again. All right. Sounds great. Well, with that, I am going to let you have the rest of your evening. Thank you so much, man. All right. Thanks, Darwin. All right. Thanks, everyone. So there you have it. Uh, many thanks to Bruce for the great chat. I uh, really appreciated hearing more about his musical background as well as his uh, developer background. If you are into his work, you should uh, get out there and check it out. He's got uh, some work on SoundCloud. He obviously has the work that he's done at Output. They're amazing plugins. And you can also go over to cadenzic.com. That's K A D E N Z E. Uh, to check out the programming tutorial that he does. The class is pretty phenomenal. 
I got a chance to take it. It was outrageously good. And uh, with that, I will uh, let you guys go. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, go out, dig around, have some fun, find cool stuff to listen to, read, watch, interact with, and make some stuff too. And uh, beyond that, if you have any questions, comments, or concerns, drop me a line. That's ddg at cycling74.com, darwin.gross at gmail.com, or ddg at 20objects.com. Any of those will get to me. Thank you so much for your time, and we will talk again soon. Bye.